In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. As we enter into Passion Tide, we only have but two more weeks before we celebrate the greatest of all the Feast of the Church, our Lord's glorious resurrection from the dead. There are many things that we could speak about, ponder, consider, when we think of the Passion of Christ. But there's something that always has never ceased to amaze me. God's chosen people had awaited a Messiah for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. God inspired the prophets to speak in great detail about who the Messiah was going to be. And when that time came, when the fullness of time came, when for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven to be our Redeemer, it's an amazing thing, as we read of in the Gospel of St. John at the end of the Mass, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. My dear friends in Christ, that is amazing. Christ worked miracles publicly. There were unquestionably miraculous events being taking place, and yet those especially who should have recognized Christ as the Messiah were the very ones who rejected him. The Pharisees, the scribes, they were learned in the law. They knew scripture. They knew the prophecies. And even when Christ would work a miracle right in their presence because of their spiritual blindness, they would not see. That is an amazing thing. They waited this Messiah for such a long time, and when he finally comes, they rejected him. They brought him to Pilate in order to have him crucified, to discredit him, to blot out his name so he'd be never remembered forever. How do we attribute that spiritual blindness? Pride? Jealousy? But when we think of our Lord's passion and death, we are reminded of human weakness. We think of Judas. He was one of the apostles of our Lord. He lived in close intimacy with Christ. He saw the miracles. He heard the wonderful teachings of Christ as even his enemies would say, no man has ever spoken like this man. And yet, even Judas, because of his sin of avarice, he betrayed Christ for pieces of silver. At the Last Supper, our Lord had warned his apostles, that one of them was about to betray him. And they all began to protest, Lord, to prison and to death. Especially Simon Peter, Lord, I'll never betray thee. And what did Jesus tell to St. Peter? Peter, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny, deny me three times. Peter was like, this is not going to happen. There's no way. And then, Yet when that moment came when our Lord was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, all the protesting about for prison and to death went out the window. They all abandoned Christ. Our Lord had warned them, watch and pray, lest you enter to temptation. And they didn't heed our Lord's words. They slept. Peter, for his love for our Lord, wanted to know what would happen to our Lord. So he entered into the courtyard of Caiaphas, and while he was warming himself, he was put on the spot. You're one of his disciples, aren't you? Where was that courage that he spoke of at the Last Supper? It was gone. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this man. Our Lord had warned Peter. Peter didn't pay attention. And just as Christ had foretold, Peter, this very night you're going to deny me three times. What are the lessons we can learn from this? we can learn our own human weakness and how important is the grace of God. You might say, well, I've been in the traditional movement. I've been going to the Latin Mass. I go to daily Mass. 
You might feel real secure, but we always have to watch and pray because it's a matter of God's grace. God's grace enlightens our minds to see the truth. God's grace strengthens our will to help us to do the will of God. And we cannot underestimate the importance of God's grace in our life, and especially that we don't become spiritually blinded by passion. That is the reason why, my dear friends in Christ, we have to have a prayer life because the chief means of grace are prayer and receiving the sacraments. The weaker we are, the more important it is that we bolster our spiritual life. We really pray and meditate, do spiritual reading. When we receive the sacraments, how important it is that we receive them with as much fervor and zeal as possible. These are these tremendous sources of grace not only sanctifying grace, the life of God in our soul, but there's also, with the sacraments, a special sacramental grace peculiar to that sacrament. I have to share with you an interesting encounter. I meet some very, very, what I would consider devout Catholics as I travel. Everywhere I travel, it's, it's wonderful to see God's grace working in souls. There's a young family in western Kansas. Five years ago, the father died. He died a very devout death, but left his wife and six children behind. It's five years ago. This past summer, the 12-year-old boy, his name is Malachi, came down with a, an illness that has basically paralyzed his arms and his legs. He can't move, he's paralyzed from his neck down. Not only that, but he's also having difficulty breathing, so he's like on, a, on an oxygen machine to help him to breathe. He has a trach at the bottom of his neck. I am absolutely amazed at this young man's patience. He's so resigned. He's so patient. Does he have his moments where he gets scared? Yes. But he cannot do anything for himself. Can't even scratch his nose. He was sent to, from Kansas, they sent him up to Children's Hospital, providentially in Omaha, only 10 minutes away. We were able to visit the religious priest and laity visit him often. And I have to tell you this. After six weeks, his mother learned how to use the, clean the trach out and do all those things, keeping the oxygen machine going. They send him home, flew him home. And whenever I get a chance, I go to visit him to encourage him to suffer patiently to draw down graces for souls. But he indicated to his mom when he, when he can't talk because of the trach, he clicks. He goes, and she say, what do you need? And she, he'll mouth the trach down. So she'll take something out of the trach and he can talk. What were his first words to me? Bishop, what do you think I should give up for Lent? <laughs> I said, Malachi, I think you got a lot to offer up already. I mean, you can't even scratch your nose without somebody helping you. And by the way, I'll tell you about that. When he was in the hospital, his mom was out in the hallway maybe talking to a doctor or whatever, he'd indicate, scratch my nose. And I'd take a washcloth and scratch his nose, and when he got the trach down, he told his aunt, nobody scratches my nose as good as the bishop. So, <laughs> so I'm good for something, I tell you. But don't ask me to scratch your nose, okay? <laughs> but I have, to, I have to admire this, this, this boy. He's 12 years old. Uh, he struggles sometimes. He has his difficulties, etc., etc. He's cheerful. He has a sense of humor. I, I was going into the hospital room one time and I said, I was looking at my text messages and I said, Malachi, you're getting, I'm getting text messages from everyone around the country. Everyone's praying for you. And he mouthed the words, is Biden praying for me? I said, I said, I think Biden needs to pray for himself. <laughs> 
But I have to just say this, it's to me a great edification to see this young man, 12 years old, and has all these crosses and sufferings and how patient he is. I'm in admiration of God's grace. When we think of God's grace though, when we think of receiving the sacraments, like we've said so often in the past, how important it is that we receive the sacraments as fervently as we possibly can. You never know when you go to confession. When I'm confessing my sins, this might be my very last confession. When I receive Jesus in Holy Communion, how important it is that I receive him with much love and devotion and recollection, staying focused on his real presence within me, because this might be the very last time I receive Jesus in Holy Communion. When we kneel down at night before we go to bed and pray that act of contrition, how many times have people not woken up and the next morning they died in their sleep? So we never know the day nor the hour. And as Jesus has so often exhorted us, let us always be ready. For those of you who are going to be confirmed to become soldiers of Christ, as you well know, you've studied your catechism, you've been instructed. But we administer the sacrament by imposing our hand on your head and anointing your forehead with chrism, with the sign of the cross. The forehead, because that is the most prominent part of your body, what everyone sees. The sign of our salvation, the sign of the cross. The chrism signifies the strength of soul. And at the moment we give you confirmation, an indelible mark is placed on your soul as a soldier of Christ. You're going to get an increase of sanctifying grace. You're going to get special sacramental graces where the Holy Ghost is going to help you to know and to do the will of God. We all need God's help. We all are weak. We have our temptations. And as Jesus has told his apostles, let Jesus also, his words, remind us. We always need to watch and to pray lest we enter into temptation. St. Peter, in his epistle, we read this every night when we recite Compline. He says, Brethren, be sober, be watchful, for your adversary the devil goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, strong in the faith. Yes, we have but two more weeks before we celebrate our Lord's glorious resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> Let this time of Lent and Passion Tide especially be an opportunity for us to grow in our love for God and to serve God with generosity. God deserves our very best. He created us out of nothing. He keeps us in existence. Every good that we have comes from his loving hands, and let us make a point, especially those who are going to be confirmed, to truly receive the grace of God and use that grace to bring forth fruit in abundance. God wants all of us, all of us to become saints. He wants to reward us with the eternal happiness in heaven, and it is possible. There were some saints who were not born saints. They, they, they had lived a sinful life. They were in a wrong path and God's grace converted them and they became great saints. That should be an encouragement for all of us that by the grace of God, we can become saints and God wants us to become saints. And what other choice do we have? If we don't make it to heaven, where are we going to go? We also have to remind ourselves, too, the great price that Jesus paid for our souls, the price of his precious blood. Greater love than this no man hath that a man lay down his life for us. And Jesus has been the good shepherd to lay down his life for his sheep. His mother Mary stood at the foot of the cross, and she's our spiritual mother. She knows the price that Christ paid on the cross to redeem us and to get us that chance to get to heaven. So let us do our best to, during the last two weeks of Lent, this Passion Tide, 
grow in our love for Jesus because he has loved us. Let us grow in our love for our Blessed Mother, our spiritual mother who stood by the cross of Jesus. And she cooperated, just as Eve had cooperated in the fall, Mary cooperated in our redemption by living that fiat. So for those who are going to be confirmed, congratulations on becoming soldiers of Christ. Those of you who are sponsors, remember at the time of confirmation, put your right hand on the right shoulder. And those who are being sponsors, remember, pray and exhort them to the practice of their faith. And lastly, as you know, when you get confirmation, we give you a slight slap on the cheek. That's to remind you to be ready to suffer, ready to suffer for Christ as a soldier of Christ. That's how we show our love for God, when he, when he allows sufferings and trials and difficulties and crosses in our life, we carry our cross after Jesus. And remember this, there'll be no crown in heaven unless we walk that royal road of, to Calvary. There'll be no crown without the cross of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.